Hello, Colchester. Hello, Barry St. Edmunds. And of course, hello to our online community. Everybody say hi. Good to see you. It is so good to have everybody with us this morning. We are going to take some time now to hear from Steve and Angie. We have some questions for them. We've, got, we've been asking for questions all week. Um, and in the room, we're going to give you an opportunity, and online, um, if you're watching with us live, to ask questions now. So you might not have had a moment, so please feel free. We're going to give you a minute to, um, to head to Instagram or Facebook Messenger and send us a question. Anything you would like to know from Steve and Angie. Be kind. I mean, I'm really nosy, so you go for it, and I'll see what I can do. <laughs> um, and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the last 28 years of leadership here. We're going to talk about the legacy of the church. We're going to talk about embarrassing moments. We're going to talk about funny moments. We're going to talk about heartfelt moments. We're going to talk about Greg's orders, because I have heard from my audience, and I understand the importance of various things. Um, but we want to hear from what you want to know. So I'm going to give you a minute, genuinely, to, um, to go to the C3 Church on Instagram or on Facebook and send us those messages. And through technology, I will then receive them all and we will move on. Does that sound good? So um, maybe we could play some like casual, non-awkward music for a minute while you all ask questions. Go for it. That's your cue, Luke. Yeah, or that. You could make the, the worship team are gonna provide the music if we don't. So. <laughs> Come on, need to see more of you on those. If you don't know how to DM or do, find someone who looks about 12 and they'll know. All right, just ask them. Can you send this question in for me? Uh, and we'll answer. Sarah just said, anything you don't want to answer, any subjects? And I just said, no. I don't know whether I mean that, but um, we don't know what the questions are. So <laughs> come on, send them in. I'm feeling a bit nervous. Nervous. Yeah. When you do a preach, you know what you're going to say, don't you? You do. You plan it. I led worship yesterday. That was the most nerve-wracking event Woo! in my life for the last 20 years. I haven't been doing it for 20 years. I've got sore fingers. He's been nervous all week. Something like saying, oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> but he did Aww. great. He did great. Do Watch it again. Out. Watch out. Or just wait a few wait. minutes. You never wait. know what's going to happen. Spoiler. <laughs> um... Alrighty, you can keep your questions coming and the team are going to get them to me via Slack. Um, and um, we're going to do this in a really smooth and transitioning way, okay? Everybody ready? Okay, so genuinely though, Greg's orders. If you're going to Greg's, what are you, you going to order? What's Greg's? <laughs> okay. I, I know where that question was from because <laughs> there's a Greg fanatic in the congregation. Um, <laughs> If Greg's. I didn't ask it. Sausage it, roll. Sausage roll. There you go. Vegetarian sausage roll. Vegetarian sausage I'm a vegetarian, roll. but it feels a bit healthier. Okay. Happy? Can we move on? Great. <laughs> okay. So, um, let's just get into the thick of it. Um, how have you kept yourselves and your leadership team accountable over the last 20-odd years? We're going to do this all the way through now. We're going to look at each other and say, do you want to go first? Do you want to go first? Accountable, that's a, that's a big word, that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think we've kept ourselves accountable personally, as in our leadership, with the relationships that we've got across the country. Mm -hmm. So we have key people that speak into our lives that we're very open with, that are there very open with us. Um, they lead other churches or they've been involved in leadership for many years. So I think that accountability is really strong. And I think that then um, comes down into our leadership team because we're keeping ourselves accountable. We keep each other accountable and we see the value of it. And so we, we, we hold our team to account as well. So we do have open and honest conversations. We do have lots of one-to-ones. Um, we will bring people up if we see things that aren't um, good ways of, of treating each other or good ways of um, serving each other. I spoke to a lady recently, we went away to a th thing called High Lee, which is a conference center, and I spoke to a lady there from Christian Aid, and she was the chair of Trust of Christian Aid, and I said, how do you keep 
the vision and values across Christian Aid. They've got like 800 staff or something in the, um, across the organization. And she was saying, first it's policy, that's what's written in, and how we treat one another is written kind of legally, you know, formally. But also it is then the culture that you're bringing into the organization. And that's what we keep on working at our culture here at C3 with our staff, with our team. We have C3 Circle every Tuesday, and that's where we want to keep on culture that's happening. I think as well, accountability, which is a word that's used, particularly in the last few years because of a load of stuff that's happened out in the church. Um, true accountability comes from proximity. If you will let people in and close to your life, that's where true accountability lies. Because you can, you can hide, and we've tried not to hide. In our 28 years here, we've tried not to hide. We've tried to be accessible to people. Uh, we do need boundaries. Everyone needs boundaries, or, or, or you'll kill yourself in the process of leadership. But I think we've always sought to be honest, open, look into our lives. We've got nothing to hide. Um, and I, I get more and more concerned about leaders and leadership teams that become enclaves on their own that don't let anybody else into. So ultimately as well, we must remember we're accountable to God. I read an article yesterday about pastors um, before I came out in the morning. And it, it said, remind yourself every time you get up to preach, it's just not about you. And that's a really good thing to do. Because those that start to think it's about them start to think they're above levels of accountability that others have because they're, they're the king, um, you know. So I think it, proximity is one word I, would, I say we try to do. Keep yeah. proximate. Proximity ensures accountability. I like that a lot. Um, okay, so in terms of your leadership, you've been here for 28 years now. Um, that's a good chunk of time. Um, and you will have had various ups and downs through that season. How have you managed to cope with the pressure of leadership? And have you ever got to a point maybe where you've thought, oh, I don't know if I'm into this anymore? And then what's yeah. moved that for you? I suppose I should go first this time because we did, you went first last time. Okay. Take turns, is that okay? <laughs> um, just keeping myself accountable. <laughs> Uh, have we kept fresh and have we, and have we ever felt like giving up? Yeah. I felt like, I have felt like giving up more Monday mornings you can ever imagine. <laughs> um, I, I have felt like giving up many times. Uh, Angie is, is more consistent than me in her emotional makeup. Uh, I am more emotional and I know that, so I have to watch my emotions and, and guard them. Uh, how have I coped? Reality is, I haven't always coped. <laughs> uh, you've thought of coping, but behind the scenes, I haven't always coped. Um, and there was one time, particularly, uh, and this was in lockdown, but I just turned to Angie and said, that's it. I am done. I'm done. And she didn't believe me. Uh, and therefore brought things back into a kind of state. But I will, I will say this. For us in our life to stay the long haul, um, we've always had Mondays off. Mondays has been really important. And I remember when we came here, especially you people that don't have Mondays off, people say, oh, you get Mondays off. We don't. You know, and, I, and the pressure to say, oh, I should work a Monday as well. If I'd have done that, and we've worked Mondays when we had to, it'd have killed us. And, and I mean, literally. If, if we'd have just done seven days a week. Uh, it, so Monday we got very religious about we're having Monday off. That gave us a richer marriage, it gave us time with our family, and that was really, really important to us. So that kind of space. And then our home being that place of rest. We, we, would, we had some the trustees around a few weeks ago, and I think we were telling this story, or somewhere I've told it. We built an extension on the back of our house. This is very practical. But we built that extension, this was in 2002, we built that extension on the back of our house so that when we had people around, because we had people in and out all the time, we could go in there and have those tough conversations and you know, people would walk out and the children could have a space that was their space, the lounge, that didn't bring work into the home in that way. Because honestly, work and home and the place of, of how that, where that crosses over in our kind of role is, is, is a fine line. So 
we built that, and it's been, it, it did what we intended. So we have you know, meetings in the back room while the family were in the, the front room. And that was very practical to just try and keep that demarcation. What we've never been good at, and this is true with our family, everyone says, it must be lovely having your family working on staff. It's lovely, and it's a pain in the neck sometimes. So I'm going to be as, I decide just be as honest with you as I, I can today, because we probably, as they've been growing up, and then as they came onto staff, held them to a higher level of account than we did to the rest of the staff. We would criticize them more than we would the others and wouldn't let them get away with things more than the others because they were our family. Um, but we talk about church in all kinds of contexts and the, it crosses over. So we have to watch that very carefully and sometimes there's an awkward silence because we all want to talk about church because that's our world, but we, we're not. We're keeping quiet. Uh, having grandchildren been the, one of the best things ever to keep you distracted. That's not the only reason to have grandchildren, but, you know, <laughs> playing Lego and building a fire station just keeps your mind on different things, you know, and it really helps. Don't, we're not available for hire, by the way. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, I was going to say, I think holidays have been really important for us over the time as well as family, so that we've got away and actually, da you know, we had downtime, um, important to have downtime. I think um, also, you know, you've preached on it many times, the call that we felt over our lives. So we've felt this call and known this call that God's called us to it. And so when things have been tough, um, I've tried to, in fact, it was a book that I read over lockdown, to see that God's now stretching you and there's something new that he's got for you, which is in the next season. So when we were going through really difficult times and it was particularly tough losing Steve's mum and then losing Tim Creamer here in the congregation was a, a particular, that was in one month, that was so hard to be grieving for a family loss as well as grieving for a church loss and leading the church through that season. Um, this is the challenge is that you have your own personal challenges, but also you know you're, you're walking it when everybody's watching you and thinking, how are you going to react and how are you going to respond in this? Because they, you guys take a lead from us, which is that's our role. Um, but that's the double pressure. Um, and during that season, I read a book by Sam Chand, and it's saying, you know, God is stretching me right now, and there's a purpose in it. Mm -hmm. And that's what kept me thinking, okay, there's purpose in this. I'm hating it. It's horrible. I don't want to go through it. But God's going to build something in us through it. And he says that he's going to build character through our perseverance. So that's the thing that tried, I've tried to keep thinking about. That's amazing. I think... One other thing to add, because obviously I know time's going to go, this is going to go really quickly, but um, in our role as, as church leaders, and there's a spiritual element to that, keeping our root in God that isn't just for the church has been really important. Yeah. So I can go into my study office and, you know, think I've got to prepare another message. And it might not just be here, it might be somewhere else. But I don't want to go in there every time thinking, oh, and this is to prepare a message. I want to go in there to meet with God myself yeah. and not just be reading a book or reading the Bible in order to get another message. Um, so keeping that root. For me as well, corporate worship, being with the people of God, restores my soul. Mm. And your soul gets de depleted and you need to find those things that restore your own soul. So one way we've kept fresh is being in the Word of God for yourself, praying for you, with yourself, praying with your family, going fishing. Honestly, fishing is something that restores my soul. Uh, you've heard me say many times before, people say to me, so when you're fishing, do you talk to God? No, maybe. I won't say, well, well mostly I talk to the fish. Like, where are you? What, what are you eating? How can I catch you? Come on, get on my hook. My, my prayer to God might be, Lord, I want to catch a fish, but that's about it because I'm thinking about something else to rest my mind. And I haven't done that well in other areas, but um, I try to do it then when I'm, when I'm fishing. And it, it's about the restoration of the soul. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm really encouraged by what you've shared so far. I, as these questions have been coming in, I'm going to try and categorize them a bit so that we can sort of move in a orderly flow. Um, so a couple more questions in terms of your leadership over the last couple of years, and then we'll move to some more churchy questions as well that we've got coming in. Um, Angie, yeah. 
Breathe Conference is something that you have built over the last years. How, how did that start for you and how have you seen the growth of that? And then how have you maintained passion for that? Yeah, um, it's grown, it's, I think it's 19 years this year coming up. So it's, you know, it's a long time it's been happening. Um, I've never particularly been into women's conferences. I've never particularly been into kind of a single groups meeting together. And then I went to one and I thought, if we could do a women's conference like this, which was really dynamic and was really encouraging for women and it was like building in them a resilience and a passion for God and an impact in the world, then I reckon that could be pretty powerful and that would be worth doing. And so I started doing it, um, and it's quite interesting. The first year we did it, I did it with another lady who then, uh, after that conference, left the church. And one of the trustees, I remember the time, asked me whether I'd take it on, take the conference forward, and they said to me, if you could, would you take it forward and take it on? And inside me, I was like, what do you mean if I can? I'll show you, of course I can. You know what I mean? I was like, how can you doubt that I could do this? And this was my motivation for the first few years. Like, I can prove to the world that I can do this. And then until Jesus, you know, started kind of challenging me and thinking, actually, can you do it for me rather than doing it to try and prove to everybody around you that you can do it? And then when I got to that stage, I was like, actually, you know what? God's in this and God is doing something really amazing. Um, I've seen women really grow in their passion for God, in their leadership. I've seen people just come on the platform who've never spoken before or give a testimony. And I've often said to women, you know, when they're going through difficult stuff, one day you're going to be a testimony and we're going to show that at conference because then it gave them hope and it gave them a future. It's like God is going to bring you through something. And I've seen it grow from a gathering that we kind of wanted to encourage and support to something that's really about leadership and women taking their roles, taking their um, opportunities um, responsibly and seriously. And as God's changed me and grown me in my leadership, I've really wanted to get more and more women to grow their own leadership. Um, so it's been brilliant. I, I love it. It's hard work. It takes a lot of effort um, to bring it all together. But it, I love the fact the guys really love it as well. All the guys are often at the back, you know, or sneaking in because they want to be part of it, um, which I love. I really love. It's very creative. Uh, Josh was 13 when we first started to talk. I used to say to him, can we look at some songs for Breathe? And he, we used to kind of look at it together. And um, so, yeah, he's as passionate about it as I am, I think, because he's just been in the long haul. So, yeah, absolutely. yeah I love it. I mean, we, it's very difficult to be on staff or on team and not buy to breathe. We're all really passionate about it. And I think having seen, um, I mean, with Breathe Girls and people kind of working their way through it and getting more involved every year because they catch the passion behind it. So we really enjoy coming on that journey with you. Um, Pastor Steve, uh, somebody has sent in a message and said, you have a lot of books on your bookshelf. I do. Um, and can you give any specific recommendations to people who may be struggling with grief? Oh, wow. Wow. I, I do have a lot of books. Um, and I have got some books on grief, actually. But I'm going to recommend, and I think she's in the room today, Ruth McCallum. Where's Ruth McCallum? I saw, there she is, right at the back. Shout out, what's the name of your book? Change and, Change and loss. Um, Ange particularly has a number of Ruth's books, which we give to people when they um, suffer loss. I and gave one to my neighbour just a few weeks back. Who yeah. lives in our little courtyard? Yeah. So um, that's in the house, and someone here. So change and loss. Uh, I'm trying to think of any of the other books that I've got on my shelf. And someone, I'll change the question slightly. People say, if you've read all the books you've got, I've read some of all the books I've got. All right? <laughs> and, and some of those might just be the title page. <laughs> but I've read it. Um, but I, I've, I've read most of them. Some of them are reference books anyway. I can't, honestly, off the cuff, I can't remember any other than change and loss. There's one by Tony Horsfield that we got recently. What's it called, though? House, but I can't remember what it's Tony called. Horsfield has written one um, who we follow, but <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. Um, I gave some away recently to a pastor friend as well uh, who lost his wife, and um, 
there was one by a guy called Raw, R-O-H-R, but I can't remember the title of it. Um, and I gave that to him, and I know that was really, really helpful. So I'm sorry I can't do any better, but I will find, I'll go back and find the ones that I've got, and we'll put it out somewhere with some of them. I notes. am a, a book person myself. I think we probably need to start a social media thing of Pastor Steve recommends, and just, Phil, can you get on that? Can we? Thank you. <laughs> I've got some recommendations too. Oh, Angie, I, I don't doubt it. <laughs> Do you have a book recommendation that you particularly enjoy? If, if either of you got a book that you go back to? Yeah. Leadership, life, whatever. Non-fiction, though. Non-fiction. I go back to I love John Maxwell's stuff. Mm. So, um, Infutable Habits of a, of a Leader. And yeah. I look at that one. Um, I'm trying to think what I'm reading right now. I actually, Sam Chand, I don't know whether you've read of Sam Chand, I'm looking at a book now, Stress Within Success. Mm. So the stresses that come when you're successful. So that's really interesting. So I've got that next to my bed at the morning, been reading that. I'll recommend a Sam Chand one while we're on it because it really helped me in lockdown. It's called Leadership Pain. Mm. And he basically says you can only lead to the level of the pain you're willing to wow. uh, accept. It's called Leadership Pain. Uh, but it, I'll tell you one book that changed my life when I was very young. And most of you, if you, if you ever read it, you'll, it's because it's hard to read. You won't like it. Um, so that's my challenge to you. It's called The Puritan Hope. Hmm. And it's a book I read when I was uh, 21. And it introduced me to the concept of the glory of the church like I'd never seen before. And this book isn't a modern day book. I don't know when it was written. Uh, I'd be guessing, but maybe uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. But it opened my eyes and put a passion in me. And I do keep going back to that when I get fed up mm. um, of the beauty, the glory, the purpose of the church in God's purposes. Um, so that's a book I would recommend. Go ahead and help. I'm going to ask two more questions, one um, from a member of our Colchester family and one from a member of our Berry family that was sent in earlier in the week. Um, so the one from Colchester is, what is one of the most funny moments that you can remember in a Sunday service? On a Sunday in service. a Sunday service. One of those ones when you would look at each other and be like, oh, that happened. Uh, well, we saw that question on Facebook, so we've kind of been talking about that, <laughs> but we never realized it was just in a Sunday service. Um, <laughs> I, I, this wasn't here, so it, but it was funny because you're gonna, I am going to lead us in a few songs in a moment. Um, but I used to do that in different venues around the country, and I remember coming to a, 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 some events here in Letchworth. So I was still in the Wirral, and it was coming to he, lead he, here in Letchworth, and I was only staying one night, so I didn't pat much. Um, and I went in to lead worship, and I bent down to pick up my guitar, and I got the biggest split in my pants that you wow. could ever imagine. It wasn't even a small, like, just little tear. It just went all the way down the back, and you could, you could see everything. Well, not everything, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and I had to lead worship, with <laughs> keeping directly in front of me, playing the guitar, making sure I didn't move. That was one of the most embarrassing moments <laughs> in my life. I do remember that one. I'll do an embarrassing moment, but it wasn't on a Sunday service, fortunately. Um, one time I was in hospital, I had major surgery, and uh, one of the guys was on staff team with us there, a um, guy called Tom Kyle. And he came to visit me in hospital, which was really nice of him to, you know, a pastoral visit. I um, mean, it wasn't long after this operation, and we'd just been chatting, and this nurse comes over and starts giving me the download about how, we, how I wasn't to have sex too soon after this operation, and giving this all these kind of lace details and everything, and I'm lying there and they're going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's Tom sat next to him, and he's going... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, it, it's not my husband. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty embarrassing. Oh, I'm so glad I know that now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, now they really are so. Oh, I just remembered one thing that did happen on a Sunday, but not in a service. And any of you here ever remember a guy called Gerald Coates? Gerald Coates was a kind of superstar of the evangelical world. He died a few months ago. Um, but he came and spoke here on a Sunday. And then we went out for lunch. So 
this wasn't in a service, but he was famous. Everyone knew Gerald Croats across the country. And I'm sitting there, we're sitting there over lunch with him, and I could see these people on another table. This was at the Rupert Brook in Grantchester, looking over and nudging each other. And I thought, I oh, know, they know Gerald. You know, they're all going oh, like this and pointing. So eventually the lady came over, and I thought, I know what she's going to say. She's going to say, are you Gerald Coates? And she looked at us and she said, are you Steve Campbell? Aww. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she said, well, we've got a photo of you on our wall at home, and my son's just coming to university, and I'm friends with uh, my, my, your wife's sister, and we told him to get in touch with you when he comes to Cambridge. <laughs> and Gerald Coates looked very shocked. <laughs> oh, well, to close off, this is from one of our C3 family in um, Barry, and it's a good one. There are lots of questions. We have two more services today, and I will be asking different ones. Um, sorry. But, um, <laughs> um, but this one is a great one. It says, um, what do you hope that people will know the C3 church for? It's a good question. Definitely what we've done as an impact here into our city and beyond. Definitely that it's a heart for reaching the vulnerable, reaching the lost. Definitely as a church that has influence into society at large, but also um, at the corporate level as well, at the kind of civil level that governments and council will be aware that we've seen as a significant church. Um, that's always a passion and a heart, but also a heart that people come in and lives are transformed and lives are changed. It's a place that people have a passion for God and they are really serious about their faith and they find healing and hope in this space um, is definitely a reputation we want to have. Absolutely, amen. One of the, if you read the church we see, and I'm sure you read it once a week, every week, um, it's, there's a little phrase in there that says about the church we see. And one line is about changing the perception of church. Mm. Church has a really bad rap in many different places. And church is you and me. Yeah. So what I want, you know, we use this strat line and we mean it. People really matter. We want your lives, our lives the lives of anyone that come to anything we do with impact and all we do to be so radically transformed by an encounter with Jesus that when people meet us, they're glad they met us. We're chaplains to the mayor this year in Cambridge and today we've been invited to all kinds of services actually which we can't go to because we're here um, and in a few weeks time I'm, I'm doing a, a service with um, the Queen's chaplain if she's available. And we get into all kinds of different contexts now. We spoke at the city council a few months ago. And when someone comes back to me and says, and we spoke on trust. So I, I, it's not a church service, so I'm not there to make an appeal or be churchy. I just want to bring the truth that sets people free. When co someone comes up to me and says, that really makes sense, and they don't even know it's all from the Bible, and they think I'm normal because, can I, can I just be honest? There's too many weird Christians around. There's too many weird Christians around that have given church a bad name. And I, don't, I think Christians, and you've heard me say this, we should be the most normal people on the face of God's earth because we're made in the image and likeness of God and there's something different. If you've received the Spirit, you're normal. All right? You're normal. So I want the perception of church to be changed because people really matter. And I want them to meet us so that they know they've met Jesus yeah. in meeting us. Because Jesus was the most normal person that ever lived. He was exactly how God intended humanity to be right in the beginning. That's great. He's the normal one. And we can be like that. Let's thank Pastor Steve and Angie for joining us this morning. Thank you. In the continuation of our 40th birthday celebrations, we're going to take a moment now to look at a video, which is a bit of a compilation of the look back over the years of C3. So at the end of the video, I'll hand back over to the location so that you can continue with your service. Thank you for joining us. We've loved, hasn't it been great to be together this morning? It's been so good to be together. Well, take a look at the screen and enjoy some memories from C3.
welcome everybody to the C3 church If you think it's gonna be boring then your bubble's gonna burst Here's a few dates for your diary so be alert And strengthen the faith of the God that you serve Well we're both part of the kids work team And um, we do it because of the t-shirts and the opportunity to buy large quantities of Pritt stick. And, and there is something else as well. That there's also a very generous second home allowance oh, we yes. claim for as, as a children's worker at C3. Oh, yes. Not a lot of people know that. The reality is that there is no one holy but God. The Bible says that. And yet he tells us to be holy. And the only way we can be holy is by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't do it by self-control, we won't do it by our own thinking. It's got to be by the power of the Spirit. He controls us, he lives within us. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. Good morning. Good morning. Holy lives set apart, honour to God. I'm so glad that he chose me. Chose I'm doing this from a team. Bow. Over Jesus Christ, one and only. Jesus. Spirit, holy, holy. I took to God on my dolly. Forever I'm saying, golly. Same. Now the things of the world don't control me. I'm putting up for the team. team. I'm so glad that he chose me. Chose. I'm doing this from a team. Over Jesus Christ, one and only. Catch a demon, I'm taking his head off. All of the spirits are round by the head off. On the cross, he paid my debt off. The stones are rich from the tomb like he fell off. And he don't miss. The message of God is beyond this. The devil try hit, it's a shot miss. And some he wants he don't trip. Don't run, don't trip. Jesus, bring that light back, right back. Sometimes man, them slide back. Bro, don't stretch, you've been taking a hike back. Jesus, pick it up and give right back. Give me three when Jesus strike back, fight back. Back it all, then then light that. Holy Spirit, I can't deny that. Spirit in me, could the Lord supply that. Spirit, holy, holy. I took to God on my dolly. Forever I'm saying, golly. Now the things of the world don't control me. I'm putting on for the team. I'm so glad that he chose me. Chose doing this from a team. Over Jesus Christ, one and only. Spirit, holy, holy. I took to God on my dolly. Forever I'm saying, golly. Now the things of the world don't control me. I'm putting on for the team. I'm so glad that he chose me. Chose doing this from a team. If you enjoyed this video today, why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video. And if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 Church for a little while now, why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith? Click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be.